Namaste, my beautiful co-creators. I am Isolde Kellerman, your host today from Journey of Awe. We're an interactive TV, and we are here to introduce you the latest teachings, programs to eliminate the collective consciousness. We have a very special guest today, Dr. Mancuso, who is um, a level three Reiki, uh, Reiki master and also the co-founder of the Chiropractic Resource Organization. He's been published several times and he has an amazing idea and theory about perception. Co-creators, I am Isolde Kellerman, your host today. For some reason, I am echoing. Okay, sure. let me see. And we are here to introduce you the latest teachings, programs to eliminate the collective consciousness. For some I am echoing. Just a minute, please. Dr. Mancuso, who is um, a level three Reiki, uh, Reiki master and also the co-founder of is the... Is something in you, in your case, that I am echoing? Published several times okay. and he has an amazing... Just a minute, please. Let me hear about perception. <laughs> Co creators, I am Isolde Kellerman, your host to the reason uh -oh. I'm <laughs> I love this. Let me just see. Why am I echoing? Murphy was right. I am echoing. Just a minute, please. Dr. Mancuso, who is um, a little. Oh. <laughs> Oh, let me see what what's what's happening. I'm sorry, guys. I can definitely hear it. This, this Do you, uh, uh, is it something on your side, maybe? You think it might? Uh, I don't know. Do you think it might just have to start all over again? I love this. Let me just. No, no, no. We're we're fine. I just need to um. Find out why we are echoing. Just a minute, please. I will try to cut out some some of my. Um... Oh, let me see what what's what's happening. I'm sorry, guys. I can definitely hear it. to cut out some some of my um Do you have open? How many devices? Just one. Hmm. Why what? is it echoing so bad? Do you want? Do you want me to try to uh, log out and log back in again? Yes. Why don't you log out and log back in? This is the first time I've used Hangout, so bear with me. No, no problem. I just something something is echoing like crazy. <laughs> Invite people at the end. Leave the call. I hope I can get back. Sorry, guys. We're going to be, we have a little technical difficulties here, but we're going to start all over again. There you are. There I are. Fantastic. Now we even have picture. <laughs> okay. Hello, can you hear me? I sure can. 
Okay, fantastic. So we got rid of the back the background noise. It had to be something on your end. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, well, I'm, glad, I'm glad we've welcome. got it solved, whatever it was. <laughs> what a way to change our perception here, isn't it? <laughs> so, <laughs> can you hear me? I sure can. Okay, fantastic. Well, welcome to the show. And since we eliminated the background noise, we can actually focus on our perception. So how are you doing, Dr. Mancuso? I'm doing very well, thanks. And thanks so much for inviting me on. Uh, oh, fantastic. I'm so honored to have you on the show. And uh, so please introduce yourself and tell me a little bit of your background. How has it started for you? Wow. Um, let me back up a little bit, get a little family history. Um, I spent uh, 30 years in family chiropractic practice and I got into chiropractic. My dad was a chiropractor. Uh, he was also a hypnotist. Uh, he was into uh, the afterlife. He introduced me to Edgar Cayce. Um, I had the privilege. He, he, was, he was pretty um, avant-garde for his day, um, I think, with, with some of his thinking. Um, every Wednesday night, my mom and dad would have friends over and he would invite hypnotists and psychics and people with it was, it was like my own uh, uh, coast to coast AM you know uh, wow. radio show and uh, I always wanted to be there and it was the most fascinating thing so I got kinda caught up in um, things you know steam beyond the obvious um, at any rate my dad was a chiropractor he was one of the first licensed chiropractors in the state of New Jersey uh, he practiced years before uh, when chiropractors weren't licensed and actually had to keep moving his office around uh, like some of the other guys so he wouldn't get arrested for practicing medicine without a license. Um, at any rate, uh, in 1954 that all changed. Um, his mother, my grandmother, was a spiritual healer and um, her mother, my great-grandmother, Felicia Barbera Pantano, uh, was also a spiritual healer and a bone setter in Sicily. Wow, now, that is amazing. So you came from a long line of healers. Yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking that she probably didn't go to the Sicilian School of Bone Setting and Spiritual Healing and probably learned it from uh, someone in the family. And yes. uh, so, so, yeah, it goes a long way back. And uh, there have been times in my life where I've really fought the idea of uh, being a mentor, a healer, whatever, but it, it always uh, seems to keep coming back and smacking me smacking me in the head you know it's like the universe wants to get my attention and I kind of ignore it so every once in a while it'll just whack me upside the head with a two by four you know uh, something happens in life and I say okay um, what's the plan here you know what's what's the lesson and, yeah, and I think it happens because they're trying to get your attention you know right. and if you don't pay attention the next smack is a little bit harder isn't yeah, it exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, um, battle-worn and bruised, uh, you finally wake up, and uh, I guess it, a lot of it had been ego, and, uh, you know, people will say to me sometime, um, wow, oh, I wish I could be 18 again or some such thing. Uh, I wish I could be 25 again, because mm -hmm. at 25, I was in really great shape, had more hair than anybody ought to have on my head. Uh, <laughs> And I knew everything there was to know about everything. You know, nobody. Yeah, I think I think that that is the illusion of youth. We yeah. we we think that we know everything, and that and the deeper you get into life, that's when you realize how much you have you don't know yet. Well, I've I've really dumbed down in the last several years, especially. Mm -hmm. from my, from so, my at twenty-five. So. So let me ask you this. I, I found you online through this amazing article and um, which was about perception. So mm -hmm. tell me, when did you, what was the stage of life when you came to realize that everything what we experience is actually starts in the head. It's our perception. It's like, it's like a, a photography that you we put on a certain lens and we see the reality through that lens and our mind interpret it. So how how did you what what made you write that article? I found years ago I found a book on my dad's bookshelf, uh, a book called Psycho Cybernetics. You ever heard okay. of it? By Maxwell Maltz. 
and uh, it looked interesting, so I read it. And um, he he was, uh, I believe, a plastic surgeon, and he did some amazing work on some people, and um, couldn't figure out why a lot of these people, after they, if some of them had been terribly disfigured, and he made them look, you know, like the guy next door, yet they still perceived themselves as being horribly disfigured. Mm -hmm. And he thought, hmm, there must be something to this. And he got into this whole thing about perception and um, telling yourself, or, or uh, I'm going to spit the words out and rearrange them later, all right? Uh, understanding that we become what we think about. We become what we think we are. Um, one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Larry Markson, said it well. He said, uh, who we are determines how well what we do works. Mm -hmm. okay, who we are determines how well what we do works. In other words, it's all about how you show up. All right? And these people were showing up after they had been you know, beautified. Nor I hate to use the word normal, normalized or whatever. Uh, they were showing up still disfigured. Yes. And then, as I got into uh, my chiropractic practice, I took over my dad's practice uh, in 1973 in March. He had been very ill and had hung on to it for me. Dad knew very little about business, but he was a, he was a great humanitarian. I knew less about business. All mm -hmm. right? but in about six months, um, I had succeeded very well. I succeeded in running the practice into the ground. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, um, this is not working well. And just when things were at the lowest, the bills were at the highest, and my practice was, you know, had sunk, uh, my x-ray machine blew out. It was a uh, 1952 super dynamic hydro uh, potion, whatever it was that my dad had bought in 1952. And uh, I was taking an x-ray of a woman, and I was behind the lid in my little darkroom area, and I pushed the button as usual, and it went zzz, 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 and I heard her scream. Oh, my I, gosh. The room, the room is filled with smoke, and I said, hmm, okay, we've got a problem here. So I, I really um, had to decide at that point what I was going to do. All right? I had just spent five years after college going through chiropractic uh, college and had set up this whole office, had a whole new beautiful office and lots of debts, and um, I had to make a decision. Am I, if I'm going to do this, I've got to do it with all my heart and soul. If I'm not going to yeah. do it, let's just move today, you know, and just, just you know, lick our wounds and, and move on. Well, at that time, I had met the woman who um, became my, uh, well, my late wife, Carol, and she and I got moving. And uh, we started to go to workshops and seminars and we started to go to people who were already doing successfully what I wanted to do. Yes. And, uh, the funny thing was, in the beginning, I did not think that I was worthy of doing it, of, of being successful. And so, so that was your perception of that, isn't that was it? My, exactly. That was my perception. And it wasn't until I sat down and talked to a... Uh, good friend of mine by the name of Mark Feld, who, whose family had a, a chiropractic um, office supply company in Bronx, New York. And Mark and I became very good friends, and he introduced me to uh, one of my greatest mentors, Dr. Larry Markson. And uh, I went to see Larry at his office, and uh, he was doing extremely well. He had some patients spoke wonderfully of him, and I always wanted to have the kind of an office that no matter how busy we ever got, it was always that down-home, one-to-one, personal kind of a level. And that was I was having a hard time doing that, you know. Well, it was easy because I had hardly any patients, you know. Um, but anyway, I liked what he had to say and how he was doing it. And I went back at home, and I did everything that he was doing. I mean, I even used the color scheme in his office for my own, you know. And uh, little by little... Uh, we started to improve, and we started to build the practice, and uh, it, it, it was a hoot. It really was, and we had fun with it. We worked very long hours, um, and um, 
just became the, the best friends, you know, doing this whole thing, working on this project. And uh, no. that. Go ahead, I'm sorry. So, so tell me, you know, when you're talking about that, you decided to have a mentor and yes. to kind of step into his shoes, you, you shifted your perception to his perceptions, yes? Yes, ma'am, I sure did. Um, I was, uh, you know, my perception was, uh, why aren't those patients coming in? What's wrong with them? You know, that mm -hmm. they're helping make my practice busy. And uh, he was all about service and all about, you know, putting the patient first. And I thought I was doing that, except that um, I was, uh, at the time, and I'm, I'm going to self-disclose it, I was kind of a victim. I had a victim mentality. My dad um, loved to fly airplanes and had a heart attack and couldn't get insurance anymore, and his attitude was pretty much, why me? My grandfather, his father, had had a stroke, uh, couldn't have anything to do with smoking three packs of unfiltered camels a day or anything like that. But he sat and he had a, a, a shop in front of his house years ago. And he'd sit in that shop window and just, you know, cuss out the traffic that went by in Italian, uh, which is where I learned most of my Italian, so I'm not going to speak <laughs> Italian. Um, I'm safe with words like, um, you know, linguine and clam sauce and... Uh, things like that. But anyway, so that was my my mindset. That's That was my headspace. And um, I, when I got into really becoming successful with the practice, I would go to workshops and seminars and I would spend probably more time outside the rooms where all the um, these people were, um, you know, giving their, their lectures and doing their workshops. And I would spend more time with the people after they did the workshop, I'd go buy them lunch and I'd sit down and pick their brains. And uh, I wound up, uh, little by little, as I could afford it, traveling around the country, visiting successful offices. And uh, I realized yeah, so all... I think, so I think really connecting with success, you have to find a mentor and change that little image because of the way I look at our our idea about ourselves, we have several levels of, of consciousness and which is we have the conscious mind, we have the subconscious mind and in the subconscious mind we have the self image. Yes. So I think that's where we have to start to work first to, to have any shift happening. Exactly and uh, I needed a major shift and, and it, it just happened gradually and I wasn't at the time um, uh, quite as evolved as I've become uh, on my journey and it was all physical and it was all pretty much what you see is what you get. Um, I didn't do a lot of thinking about it. I just said, okay, this works, let's do it. Uh, I think my level of consciousness and awareness was, was very limited at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, even with that, we became extremely successful and as we became successful. I actually had other chiropractors coming to my office to see how I was doing what I was doing. And I wound up training their staffs and I worked with the State Society for the uh, uh, doing presentations for the, the newly licensed chiropractors. And um, as we grew, we had to hire more associate doctors. At one point, we had several clinics. We had six chiropractors, a staff of about three dozen, um, and me with my hair on fire trying to manage it all, you know. Um, but it became very difficult to train people. Yes. So what it, because what I do is like, okay, we've got to do this. Okay, let's look at this book from this workshop. We're going to do this. Let's do this book from that workshop. It was all just a big hodgepodge. So during a blizzard in March of uh, 1984, I was sitting at home and I decided to write my entire office procedure from, from the time a new patient called on the phone right on through the report of findings and, and you know past their exam, et cetera, et cetera, exactly the way I wanted it done. And uh, with that in mind, that that just kind of got me onto something. Mm -hmm. It was another, it was another piece of this this puzzle that I call consciousness. And I know we had discussed this before. Um, and I had this feeling life is like one of those big puzzles, you yes. know, with a thousand pieces and. Uh, you sit there and you've got a few pieces together and you sit and scratch your head because nothing else seems to fit until somebody comes along and says, hey, look at this piece. It goes over here. And they put the puzzle piece in place and you go, oh, look at that and this, 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 and this and I'll go with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I was getting all these pieces together gradually um, 
and my ADD is kicking in. Uh, <laughs> no worries. Uh, so, right. but but don't you think that you know many times when we struggle with with challenges, and I find that challenges offer you two things that it can lock you if you identify with the challenge it locks you into that reality into misery or it can be a catalyst that helps you to find a new puzzle piece so how did you how do you find challenges in, in your life how, how did they help you to push you to get a new perspective on the situation um, part of it I think and I'm just thinking of this right now you really stirred something here I think it was um, partly due to the fact that I was a professional procrastinator mm -hmm. and that I would generally uh, wait until the last minute to do something and then you know um, get it done as quickly as possible and in some amazing way it would, it would work out sometimes you know but I, I think also the, the idea of um, with time with more of those pieces of the puzzle coming together uh, that more things fit together and I mean I've had I've had some calamitous things happen in my life uh, in the last few years, and uh, I've been been sometimes at the lowest point in my life in the last few years. But what I got to realize was that that nobody else was going to going to do it for me. Nobody else was going to get me out of that. It was sort of like after after my first wife was killed in a car crash in 2000, and she loved cats, and. Mm -hmm. After she passed away, uh, I was walking through the foyer one day and I saw a uh, cat fur ball, you know, just kind of like tumbleweed going through the through the foyer. And I said, and I left it there. And the next day, um, I went past again and it had brought friends. And the next day, it dawned on I me, mean, nobody else is going to be cleaning up that cat fur. <laughs> you have to do it. <laughs> so, I mean, so, I mean, it's just like, you know, how do you get from one mindset to another? You have a choice. You're you're out in the middle of the middle of the the, uh, the a lake, and you fall in. You you you've got to swim, or you're going to sink. You know, and I learned to swim. I learned to swim, and it was a matter of survival for me. Uh, I think that um, in some ways, and, I, and don't get me wrong, my dad dad was a great guy, and he gave me a lot of good examples uh, of how to live my life. Um, but I knew that I could not stay where I was and be happy with myself. But don't you think? But don't you think that you know? And I'm not romanticizing about pain, but you know, many times when we get comfortable in our life, we stop growing. Oh and, yeah, we stop doing. We stop and, doing the things that got us to grow in the first place. Exactly. Yes. Yep. And I think that discomfort reminds us that we need to go back to the growth pattern and then we need to shift our perception about the situation. And many times we get attached to certain outcomes and that causes suffering as well. But it's all about like fine tuning and, and uh, shaving a fine diamond that mm -hmm. we find within. But it has to... Sometimes in the human experience, it comes through somewhat suffering. Uh, yes, it can uh, definitely show up as suffering, and it's that that has brought me out of so many um, bad situations. And I was thinking of something while you were talking. And I'll think of it later on. Um, but I just, I just know, like I said, that like I couldn't stay that way. Uh, I didn't want to be that way. I knew that you know, if somebody didn't move the fur balls, they were going to stay there. And uh, that's an, that was another one of those little pieces of the puzzle for me, mm -hmm. because, because when I was just coming out of this this negative uh, experience that I've had in the last few years, um, that the thought of the vision of those fur balls came into my mind as a piece of the puzzle, and all of a sudden, you know, we've got enough fur for the whole darn cat. Yes. And, and the other thing that I found is that, and uh, it's. It's it's so weird, you know. Like we we know these things intellectually, but spiritually, sometimes it takes a while to really get it and to own it. I mean, I've been telling people, you know, um, things for years, and uh, so it was like, take my advice because I don't need it, you know. Um, but um, I was always able to help other people understand their situations 
while I wasn't understanding mine at all. I was just, I was just, uh, I was sort of like, you know, when you go on an airplane and they tell you, you know, if the cabin pressure drops and the oxygen masks come, uh, come down, yes. if you're traveling with small children, what are you supposed to do? Yes, you need to help yourself first, you so know. And, yes. And what I was doing was I was helping everyone else put on their masks. In the meantime, I was suffocating. Yes, and I think finding that balance that in life is, is really important because, you know, going back to that experience that many times we intellectualize the situation, but the true value, what we can take actually when we experience it. You recognize the pattern, you take the experience, you withdraw every lesson what you need to withdraw from it, and it becomes yours. Exactly. You know, without it, you cannot really teach it, you cannot give it to others. When you become it, that's when you become the living example. Then you start to vibrate on that level, and right. you attract things naturally, because right. that's what you become. Well, I mean, th that's the old saying, you can't sell what you don't own, and I really didn't yes. own it. And uh, during, I had uh, developed a uh, coaching practice, mm -hmm. uh, mostly on the phone, through emails, whatnot, and I uh, had a nice clientele, and when I was going through all this stuff, I kind of let it go because I felt rather hypocritical trying to fix everybody else's lives while mine was falling apart. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, um, after my first wife's death, um, one bad marriage, several heart attacks, and some financial disasters later, here I am, and looking forward to every day again, and thank and thanking God, the universe, for for another day, another chance to get it right, and that is all my perception. Nothing's changed. Nothing changed in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I'm see. I'm making hand gestures to you, and I know you can't see me, but just because <laughs> I'm, I'm Italian. So, okay. Uh, so let, let me let me ask you this: How many times, by contrast, you see, we have to find the contrast in them, um, or the gift in the contrast, because contrast shows up for us to really define what we want. Remember, we can identify with the contrast and become it and live in a state of misery, or it helps us to create a platform and design what we want. It helps us to give us clarity, in a sense. Absolutely, and I think that this, this reminds me of uh, Khalil Gibran's The Prophet, and when mm -hmm. he talks about uh, joy and suffering. Are you familiar with that? He says that no, the, but please share us. <laughs> the, the greater the, the if you want the greater the joy, then the greater the suffering you have to have to compare it. It's like you know you can't have a sunny day without having rain. Sometimes mm -hmm. you, know, you can't appreciate it, and I think a lot of it has to do with appreciation for life and understanding that this too shall pass. I sound like a, a, just a, a dictionary full of cliches here, but that it is temporary, uh, and, it's, and it's a situation uh, I learned from uh, Sammy Sharouche, who was my uh, Reiki instructor at the Harmony of Wellness Center here in Wilmington, North Carolina, um, that there are no bad choices. Right. Yes, Perfect. and I think that's, that's really important. I think that's where I get a peace of mind that, just remember, before, before we come to this earth, we have a certain bucket list. And we fulfilling that bucket list by each experience. Mm -hmm. And if you understand that every experience had to happen in your life to take experience from it. The same thing when we go on vacation. We don't go to get it done. We go there to experience yeah, it. To experience it and to enjoy the journey. And enjoy the journey throughout. And and just remember that yes, nothing is nothing is permanent, but constant in life is change. And we are never alone in this journey because we are first of all connected. Right. And we have a lot of helpers out there, angels, the universe, the God, whatever your belief is, is fit to this need. And also that the experience had to happen for us to withdraw the lesson or the experience. And that to me gives a lot of um, peace, peace of mind that, you know what, what did I have to learn from that? What was the lesson and what was the gift in it? Because you in know, the most tragedy, we can, you know, through our story, 
we can share that with others. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can become the example of, or actually, you know, the perception game is that we see the situation from different angles. And the gift of our story from that angle makes the piece a whole. Right. We you, add to that puzzle piece. Right. You, you were, there, there are a couple of things here that, that you, you bring out for me. One, one is, um, and, and again, with my ADD, do uh, you remember when you were in school and you, you had math and you couldn't just put the answer down, you had to show your work? Uh, yeah. Well, what, ha what happens sometimes, and I just, just want to let you know, is that... <laughs> Feel free. It's your time. <laughs> okay. Someone will say something like, oh, what a beautiful day, and I'll say, mm, beautiful day, sunshine, I need to go get some sunscreen. Oh, okay, but while I'm at the drugstore, I'm going to do this, blah, 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 you know, and it goes from one thing to another, and I'll say apple pie. And they'll uh -huh. look at me and go, huh? <laughs> you know, because I didn't show my work. All right? Yeah. But, but one of the things that you brought to mind here for me is sailing. I've had a lifelong love of sailing, and uh, as I got older and, and could do it, uh, we got a sailboat, and uh, as a couple, we, we used to go with another couple uh, to the Caribbean and, and bear boat charter, a nice sailboat, and people said to me, how can you stand sailing? You know, it's just so much work. And uh, I, I said to the golfers, you know, it's, it's kind of like when you're out there on the golf course and you're chasing that ball around. You have to know your stance and how to hold your hand, you know, everything. And, but this one particular time, we had been on, on a sailboat for 16 days in the British Virgin Islands. And we were peeling ourselves off the deck to pack up and go home. And up pulls this speedboat, some cigarette-type boat with people with helmets and with um, life vets, and they're all excited, and they're going like, oh, uh, sailboat, how did that work out, you know? I said, oh, it was great, we spent 16 days. Yeah, well, you only got one day, this is the best way to do it, you know, with the yeah. speedboat. And that's the difference, the, the purpose, and yes, I, I, think, I think I was very fortunate to be able to have that time to be able to do that, but yeah. the difference was so dramatic, because we're just sitting there looking at each other going, oh, okay. Uh, um, but to be able to enjoy the journey, not hang on for dear life. Okay, there's uh, uh, Ginger Island. Okay, there's St. Thomas. Oh, there, you know, it's like boom, 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 and you saw it. Okay, that's fine. That's that's the difference between peace of mind and uh, and enjoying the journey and just getting to the destination. You know, um, I mean, one guy there told me he says he couldn't wait to get back to the dock because he's, he was uh, thought he was going to get his uh, kidneys bounced out of his body. You know, but anyway, um, but there's that, and the whole sailing thing got me to realize that it is about the journey. Yes. When I lived in New Jersey, lived out in the country, I, I decided I was going to start jogging, and uh, we had a lot of you know, hilly roads around, and I thought, well, before I jog, before I run, I'm going to walk. So I walked a little bit, and the next day I walked a little more, and a little more, and a little more. I finally got to love, love walking. And, um, you know, when you walk long distances, you've got a choice. If you're halfway from home, you can look ahead of you and look at how far you've got to go, or you can look behind you and see how far you've come. Yes. And for me, that became a metaphor of my life and things that I needed to do in my life, another puzzle piece. All right? And I remember one day I was out, early, beautiful June morning, warm, dry, breezy, and I, was, I had stopped and I was under a tree looking at this beautiful horse farm with horses grazing and rolling hills, and this puff of wind hit me. And uh, I said to myself, God, I wish I was sailing. And this loud voice said to me, be where you are. Wow. Thought, oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I thought somebody was there. And um, I said, okay. So I continued on my walk, and I went past an oat field, and I saw the wind coming along the top of the oats. And I said, oh, that's just like when you're out at sea, and there's a, a waft of wind coming, and it's what it does to the top of the water. You know, I can have the same pleasures here uh, without the expense and the, and the nauseous feeling, you know. Uh, and uh, that day I walked for four hours and I clocked it with my car and it was like 16 miles that I had done because I just kept walking and it was just, yes. just a wonderful experience. But the, I couldn't have done that had I not 
learned to be present and to be in the now and be in the moment and not, you know, be somewhere and wish you were somewhere else, you know. And that, again, I, is, is perception. I mean, I, I could have perceived that, oh, my God, I've got 16 miles to go. Um, you know, I used to do little crazy things. There was one spot where it was a really steep hill I had to go up, and there, was, there were high-tension wires crossing it, and I could hear all the zing, 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 you know, the buzzing and whatnot going on, and I just envisioned that energy pulling me up the hill. You know, it was it yeah. was my perception, and it just it just helped me many times get up that hill. You know, and uh, but getting up the hill in life is just as important. And again, another piece of the puzzle right there. All right. Um, yes. What I wanted to say is that. You know, we have to really learn to um, appreciate the present moment because we never lived in the past. We're never going to live in the future. We always live in the now. Yeah. Now, exactly. And, uh, and that's where, you know, we many times make, make an enemy of the present moment because we are trying to, you know, uh, regret past experiences or worry about the future. Yeah, we're anxious about the future and we really do rob from the moment. Yes, and yeah. also what I learned is that when I learned to surrender, remember we talked about angels and God mm -hmm. and the universe, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that when you learn to surrender in that moment, when you trust the process of life, when you accept the fact that you're always in the right place in the right time, the right time. withdrawing the experiences, the lessons, like getting the juice out of the orange, okay? Right. Enjoy the juice. squeeze <laughs> 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 out. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and just really... Uh, not to analyze it, but just be in the moment and appreciate that time. It exactly. helps us to really draw all that cosmic energy into our body and really experience and allow the new things to come into our life. It's like creating the perfect platform, isn't it? When you are in the moment, when you connecting to your breath and trusting life, Oh, you're getting rid of all the emotional clutter that's the, the yes. past. Year. Yes, we get rid of all the emotional garbage, the white noise mm -hmm. that that stops us actually from from getting ahead. And I think that's the best way to to get out of our you know supposedly fixed reality because nothing is fixed. Everything is pliable, guys. Everything is movable. But the more you play, the more you relax, the more you allow to be in the present moment as is, mm -hmm. the more our reality becomes pliable and playable, like clay. Right, and, and pretty much, I mean, not pretty much, but our, our perception becomes our reality. Mm -hmm. It's, it's and, what we think and who we think. And, and uh, there's somewhere on, on my Facebook page, I posted a... Uh, a picture, a, a drawing of a um, rhinoceros painting a painting of the local scene. Uh -huh. and what does the rhinoceros have in front of him all the time with that big horn sticking up? Uh -huh. In his painting, he had this beautiful scene, but in the front of it, in the foreground, there was a horn. <laughs> that was his reality. All yes. Right? So many of us go through life looking through that rhinoceros horn and go, going around it and going sideways, we, after a while we don't even notice it because yeah. it becomes part of, part of our, uh, uh, part of us, you know, and part of our, our daily life and uh, how we deal with things. And until someone says, um, hey, you know, there's a, there's a big horn in front of your face there, you know, uh, and you go, oh, okay, I had no idea. You know? and yes. You, and you have a choice at that time, though. Okay, you can change your perception and understand that that's just your thing, that big schnoz sticking out there, or you can go, oh, okay, that's really not part of the reality of it. This is different. Mm -hmm. Things aren't as bad as I thought they were. You know. Um, and I think it relates back to that it's part of us. You know, I think. What do you think the biggest illusion of our reality or duality? Oh my God! Oh my God! That's a tough question for me. Um, 
because there's so many things. Uh, I know you're going in a certain direction here. Um, That's okay. Just, just throw out what comes to your mind. What is our biggest illusion? Our biggest perception of where we are is our... Um, so what I'm looking for, our self, our level of self-awareness. Mm -hmm. I think is a biggie. Um, you were looking for something else, but that's a good thing. No, no, no. Actually, it's you know, it's it's perfect because I I agree on some level. I think our biggest illusion is that we are separate from everything else. Everything. Okay. All right. And and also is that 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 we. We don't realize that who we are, and and you're right. The, our lack of awareness of our inner power and our capabilities is probably one of the biggest challenges that I think that our reality shows us. Because everything is mirrored back to us. You see, when you talked about the horn of the rhinoceros, for for example, that was first of all, it's part of his own identity, and many times we project it to others. And the same thing happens to us. But I think it's that, that illusion of separation, that we are different from everyone else, or we are separate from everyone else. I, I remember I had a, uh, uh, my, one of my wife's cousins had the family nose. It was very large, had a big, big bump in it, and kind of, a, it kind of hooked to the left a little bit, you know. And um, she had her nose fixed. But after mm -hmm. she got her nose fixed, she still had the issue about her nose. She wouldn't let go of it. And, yeah. you know, when, when people say to me, oh, don't look at that zit on my forehead. Mm -hmm. well, well, you know, you never even noticed that there was a zit there until they brought it, brought it to your attention, you know. Um, or please don't, be, please don't become aware of the fact that I'm neurotic and, and you know, I have suicidal tendencies or whatever it is. Uh, it's just that we sometimes get to a point where we wear our um, that part of ourselves as, as, as clothing. Uh, I had, a, I had a, a female patient years ago who had all kinds of symptoms. She had really bad sciatica, pain in her leg, and we had to carry her into the office a whole bunch of times. Um, her husband was really into golf. And we went to visit neighbors of theirs one time, and they were out in the yard. Oh, come on in and see our house. And over the bed was a giant picture of a, of a golf course. And I thought, okay, I think I see the problem here. You know, she's a golf widow. And um, she was just about debilitated. And honestly, um, what's the saying? You know, her, her symptoms added up to no known disease, you know, mm -hmm. and... Uh, in her mind, she had all this illness. It, it was all um, so, um, psychogenic rather than psychosomatic, I believe. But years later, I hadn't seen her. We, uh, she had moved away, and then they moved back into town. We were coming into a restaurant with our then two-year-old son, and uh, there were her husband, she and her husband coming out. And, uh, you know, oh, Dr. McKiss, it's so nice to see you. And it wasn't like, oh, you've got a, got a two-year-old son, and blah, blah, blah. It was like... I haven't seen you in five years. Let me fill you in on the last five years of my illness. True story. Okay, that's her perception. Her perception is she is her illness. And there's well, because we identify with the mask, isn't it? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, that was her rhinoceros horn. You know, was that was that illness? And I met so many people over the years who had just that situation going on. And they had been from doctor to doctor, and all the doctors did was chase the symptoms around without getting to know the person and getting to get them to see things differently. And so from your perspective, I'm sorry, what do you think, where is the, the shift should start? When, when you deal with someone like that who is so identified with an illness, Mm -hmm. Where, as a doctor, what would you suggest to them? Where is the beginning of the shift? Well, I think that um, I don't think there's a pat answer for that. It's all. I think that everybody's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. that. Uh, with some people just mentioning it, they go, "Oh, okay," you know. And other people are in such denial. Just like this woman, she needed that pain. That was that was the the, the coat that she wore was that to protect her, was that pain. And there was no way 
uh, short of some type of nuclear disaster somewhere, that that was going to change. Um, Do you think it was her need of attention? Or she felt significant by creating attention around her illness? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, unfortunately, so at the, go ahead. I'm sorry. Unfortunately, at the time, I didn't have the skill level to be able to help her with that. And I sent her to a friend of mine who was a psychologist and a hypnotist, and uh, nothing really came of it for her, unfortunately. But mm -hmm. I can see now, and having gone through the the uh, the self awareness classes with with the Reiki. Uh, and uh, Sammy would ask me questions, and he'd say, Who's, who is Phil Mancuso? And say, well, mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm a chiropractor. And he said, no, that's what you do. Who are you? And mm -hmm. he would just ask the question repeatedly until, you know, I realized that I am, I am, period. Yes. Yeah. Nothing more, nothing less. I am. And um, that, was, that was a big realization for me, letting go of that. You know, I'm not... My son's father. I'm not a widow. I'm not uh, retired. I am, mm -hmm. and um, that in and of itself just put a whole bunch of pieces of the puzzle on the table for me. Yeah. So, do you think the identification um, with this power is to letting go of the story and the mask? It's it's letting and go. Of the Letting go of the story of the mask and also letting go of negative emotions attached to thoughts. Mm -hmm. now, you know, you know, in EFT, that's a big part of what, what EFT is all about, getting people to let go of the negative uh, emotions attached to, to thought processes. And uh, once you can get past that, it's really a... Um, it, it opens up it opens up the windows and lets fresh air in and if you're willing to see it, if you're ready, you know, uh, you'll get the idea. If you're not ready, it's, it's going to take you someplace else. It may take you like it took me years. I mean, I'm a late bloomer, you know. And yeah, so I think, you know, at Cortola we're saying that if you're not ready, you need a little bit more suffering, you know. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the two by four. Uh, yeah, that you need one more two by four to really yeah. Snap you on the head. I'm like, are you? Did you get it yet? And I think many times when we experience pain, it brings us to me. Pain is that you need it equals to need of change of perception. We're looking at the wrong way, or we are we are too attached to the item or to the person or the, to the situation, and we need to change our perception. That's when we really can shift or gain our freedom back, don't you think? Well, like the saying goes, the only difference between an ordeal and an adventure is our attitude. <laughs> okay. I like that one. It's, uh, I didn't make that up. Somebody a lot smarter than me came up with that one. Uh, but, but think about that. You know, I mean, you you can you can go you can be on your way somewhere and want to be you know be in a hurry, but have detours to go through. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember my first time driving out from New Jersey to the Chicago suburbs to get it to go to chiropractic college. Um, Interstate 80 through Pennsylvania had about a hundred miles of detours, and I said, for my first, I was oh, expletive deleted. You know, I'm going to be <laughs> late. I want to get here, blah, blah, blah. and I started to enjoy the scenery so much. Yes. The miles just went by, and I said, oh, this is really neat. Another piece of the puzzle when I look at it years later. A lot of times, that's the other thing with, with the puzzle pieces, a lot of times you don't realize when someone hands you a puzzle piece and puts it in the right place for you, you don't realize the power of that, yeah. of that placement in your life, in, in, in your life's plan, uh, until some other pieces come together, maybe way over on the other side, or you hear something that you've heard a million times before, or you read something for the first time, or read it again, and you hear it, you perceive it differently because of the other experiences, all right? And it becomes a whole experiential thing. Uh, I know we talked about uh, my idea of life being a, a perpetual game where the prize is a different set of eyeglasses. You yes, go, you go, I like that one. That mm -hmm. each time when we go through a session in our life, we gain... Or should, are we shedding or gaining some eyeglasses here? Because, you know, that's also a game of perception there. But 
Tell me about it. Smarty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely, it can go either way, okay? Whatever your perception is, okay? But my original thought was, uh, but you've made me see something else with it here too, that when you go when you go through a lesson, you get a different set of glasses. Now, if you got the lesson, you get these really cool glasses over here, which help you see other things that you would not ordinarily see because if you don't get the lesson, you keep the same vision, the yes. same set of glasses, and the next time it pops up, you don't get to see, and I'm going to mix my metaphorical fantasy land here, you don't get to see that other piece of the puzzle and how it fits. Yes. So what do you think? In my case, um, it's usually I done a lot of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. that, that helped me to shift and shed these glasses many times or get a new pair of glasses. What was your biggest catalyst in life where it helped you to, to shift? Oh my gosh, there were there were so many. Uh, I, I wouldn't I couldn't that's like asked me like what's my favorite song? You know? Pick one. Uh, pick one. The biggest the biggest shift that you had. What was the catalyst? Wow. Um it wasn't just one, it was a whole series of things. And I had gotten to a point where I was starting to feel like, uh, are you still there? Okay. Yes. Uh, I was starting to feel like, if you ever go to the arcades and they've got that game called Whack-A-Mole, where no. you're, they give you a wooden mallet and there are holes in this board and you put your money in, for some reason you want to put your money in this thing, and up pops a mole and you're supposed to whack the mole on the head, but he pops in and pops out somewhere else, okay? And uh -huh. For a while there, I was starting to feel like I was the mole in Whack-A-Mole. Mm -hmm. And my perception was that life had cheated me, right? And that um, I wasn't where I wanted to be, and it was all somebody else's fault, all right? Somebody else didn't pick up the darn cat fur, all right? Mm -hmm. And I had, in the last six months, I guess, I've met so many incredible people. So many people have come into my life. Um, part of it was because it just was going to happen. Part of it was because I was open to it. I think a good part of it was when my friend Cece Butler put me through a uh, an angel therapy session. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I could feel the very next day. At first, I thought, "Well, this is kind of interesting. Interesting meaning hokey, you know." I, I wasn't. I was not. I was fighting this tooth and nail. And the next day, I went for a walk and. I remember saying something and I was really down and all of a sudden I felt surrounded mm -hmm. by this warm, loving presence. And I knew they were all there. Yes. And I mean I like my angel friend as well. <laughs> yeah. And well this was the whole family. And and I think also a piece of the puzzle for me was a uh, a near death experience that I had. Mm -hmm. Um I'd had a heart attack, and um, the last thing I heard was, we're losing him. I was in the emergency room, and I thought, this is not good, and then I, you know, everything went blank. The next thing I know, there's my father, who had died in 1983, you know, 30-some years ago, mm -hmm. and he was standing there, and I couldn't see other people, but I could feel their presence. I could I could feel my, 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 my wife, my... my um, grandmother, uh, other people that I'd known in my life that, that, that I loved and cared about. And my father was about 35 years old instead of 70. And he says, what are you doing here? <laughs> Smack. <laughs> <laughs> really, really. He says, you don't belong here. You've got work to do. You've got, you've got lots of work to do and lots of people to teach and lots of people to help. You just get out of here. You know, Come back when it's your time. And the next day, no, I'm awake. Yeah, and that was a very profound thing for me. And I sat on that for a long time. I would tell people about it. I'd entertain myself with it. But that was another piece of the puzzle because I didn't have the right glasses on, all right, to yeah. uh, to see it. And I and th there was there was something that happened during the angel therapy session. And now I guess I'm telling everybody. Um, it's okay. The world knows now. There are angels out there, and they okay. do have. Okay. I mean, okay. like, like I tell you, uh, Grandma Mancuso was a spiritual healer, and I'm deep into this 
meditation with the Reiki and then the, the angel therapy and Ram Das chants are going on in the background and I'm just buzzing away and all of a sudden I felt my grandmother's presence. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting because she told me where my feelings of lack of self-worth came from and she told me that she was the beginning and that this relationship that I had just gotten out of three months before back then was the end of it. And because she told me, she explained to me how I got that way and once I knew it, I knew that I couldn't go back to, to being that way. And uh, you I had you get awareness, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And and awareness, you know, you're asking me, well, where, where does awareness come from? I don't know. Okay, it just it appears when you have that combination of the right eyeglasses and the right puzzle pieces and the right mindset. And I, and I had not meditated in years. And Sammy got me meditating, you know. Um, and my goodness. Um, to get above that clutter and just get that out of there and do and do what Eckhart Tolle said about the watcher. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I tried that once when I was driving. Probably not a really good idea. <laughs> yeah, uh, don't let it take when you drive. <laughs> but, but I but I became aware of it. It's okay. Um, I'm a human driving a car. You know. Uh, yes, uh, but anyway. you can always observe your thoughts. You know, it's just I think that's an other good. You know, that's an other uh, don't, don't point of that. reality. Yeah, don't, don't point that. Don't point that thing. It's got a nail in it. <laughs> what thing? <laughs> that finger. No, your finger. <laughs> anyway. Uh, because uh, I think it's a, to separate to to separate from our thoughts. We identify with it so much mm -hmm. that we become it. But well, when you realize that you are the observer, you we start, you become, we start to believe what we think. Yes. Right. And and I think that's huge to to separate ourselves from from the story and right. recognize that actually we are not the story we're the writer of the story yep. with that comes certain power and responsibility yes ma'am um, there there go ahead there, I'm sorry no I'm I was looking for a uh, um, quote about forgiveness by uh, Lewis Smedes. Are you familiar with him? He wrote a book called The Art of Forgiving. And I can't, I can't find the quote right now, but it was something about, um, I forgave a person and, 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 and freed a prisoner and found out the prisoner was me. Yes. Yes. Uh, that was very profound for me. And that sat right next to another piece of a puzzle that I got from... Oprah Winfrey. Now I don't sit home watching Oprah Winfrey, but one day I was sitting there with the remote, ing and ing and ing, and oh, there's Oprah, and she's talking about forgiveness. And she just happened to be talking about going into a shop and seeing a woman that Oprah had been angry at for a long time, mm -hmm. and she's watching the woman. The woman is laughing and having a good time, and and Oprah said to herself, "How dare she be having all that fun when I'm so mad at her?" You know? <laughs> And, and uh, you know, doesn't she know a man? At, at any rate, it's like we need to forgive to free us. It may not do a darn thing to the person that we forgive, but mm -hmm. it does. It can do everything for us. And I meant to say that before when you were talking about forgiveness, but uh, one of my yes, tans. but but it's an interesting thing because when when we experience suffering. We think that by putting walls around ourselves and in our heart, it it will protect us. You know, it will protect our vulnerability. But here comes the paradoxical experience of our reality again. Here's another illusion that we need to shatter. Right. That we imprison ourselves exactly. in that experience. We we lock in the pain. We lock in the experience. And guess what? Who experiences all the time? It's us. Exactly. We become our self-imprisoned experience. Well, it's it's like when you when you have loss in a relationship, whether it be through death or just a breakup or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so many people do wall themselves in and don't let themselves become vulnerable, because it's that fear of more pain. I mean, pain that can be almost like death. 
you know, to yeah. some some people and, and some depths depths. Um, and if we don't allow ourselves to be vulnerable, then we can't know the good stuff either. You know, you you get behind that wall, and yeah. you shield yourself from life, the good and the bad. Right. And honestly, at this point, um, my philosophy is yes. I know there's going to be some real crap that goes on in my life. I've already experienced some, and uh, but there's also good. And I know that the stuff that I've dealt with has gotten me to where I am now. Yeah. And I'm okay. And I'm okay. And I'm, I'm more than okay. And I'm I know that um, with with all these angels that have come into my life, um, people that have helped me, uh, and I, I've hopefully helped them too. That would be friends of friends uh, on Facebook, or people would just email me. People that I didn't know, uh, call me or, or call me, ask me for advice on things, and I'm thinking, mm -hmm, I'm just I just said what was on my mind uh, based on my experience, and I realized that I do have an ability, and people do open up to me and tell me things that um, they normally wouldn't tell. Me. I mean, I don't know how many times I've heard, I've never told anybody this. And I don't know why I'm telling you. I just feel comfortable, you know, which is which is great. And I think maybe it's from 30 years of listening to people, you know, that would come into my office. Um, but it's that feeling. Um, the I, I, I don't I don't do it because I want to get something out of it. I do it because I love to help people. I love to turn them on to. Um, a different reality than the than the pain and suffering reality that they're going through. And yeah, sometimes I mean, good grief! I mean, you have a death. You, you know, a person has a child die. Oh my god! I mean, that, that I I wouldn't even want to imagine that kind of grief. But I mean, for your general day to day, like you know, aggravation. You know, the kids did this, the husband did that, whatever. Lost my job. Um, there's always a reason. And uh, I had a, a bad breakup last year, and for few months I was like, oh God, woe is me. Now I realized, you know what, uh, somebody did me a big favor mm -hmm. because it opened my eyes up and opened my mind up and opened my life up to so many good people coming into my life, you know, and uh, it's just uh, it's just changed my whole attitude and perception of things where I've gone because I had gone through this probably 10, 15 years of some really bad hits and uh, that's o it's over, but it's still with me, and um, it's part of that uh, that Nautilus idea, you know, where the Nautilus grows and it leaves behind the smaller parts, and those parts uh, they're not forgotten, but they be they become the structural basis for the the future growth. Yes, and I think it's another little piece to the. Um the perception game is that we've been taught that when we lose something, um, we have to mourn yeah. um, because we feel a sense of loss. Yeah. But how about if when we when something leaves our life, friends or relatives, um, we would look at it differently as look at how much space I have. Absolutely. Absolutely. To feel that space, what new can I bring in? Right. So that's a huge game changer. That it's how can I, you know, how much space do I have, and what new experience can I bring into this to my life? Right, and that, and that, but that is also a perception. Okay? Yes, that's a change in perception from oh woe is me, look what I lost, to oh woe is me, look at the the giant. Um, space that I've created. It's like getting rid of clutter. You know, I've mm -hmm. just recently downsized uh, a lot, and I realized that over the years, going from a big house up in New Jersey to a smaller place here, and then to an even smaller place now, um, I've always had room to store stuff. So a lot of things that are in boxes, I mean, got packed up for a move 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I always had a place to put it. Now it's forcing me to deal with it, and. Just like that in life, if you can clean out all that old emotional clutter, you make room for so many things. I mean, sometimes we have no idea what's out there for us, all right? But there's so many good things that, that can show up for you if you just let go of the past, you know? And that includes clutter. 
Yes, and, and, and also, you know, we talked about it, changing the perception through forgiveness, allowing, you know, to shed the mask, recognize that we are so much bigger than our story. Yep. And when, we, when there is a problem comes into your life, that's another um, big uh, perception shifter for me, that I am bigger than any of my problems. Yeah, and that you are not your problem. Yes, and I am not my problem. I'm so above that. That will shift immediately my perception, and it helps me to not get caught up in the anxiety part of it. Mm -hmm. and, and also clears your mind and help, helps you open up to, to, rather than thinking of the problems, this is another piece of my puzzle. I read this somewhere. Somebody said this to me somewhere. Um, don't focus on the problem. Focus on solutions. Exactly. Yeah, and that's another perception. Yes. That's, that's an attitude too. Yes, because you have to contemplate on, on the outcome. Just remember yeah. that the contrast is not there to identify with. You have the problem. That's great. It's, it's really just a catalyst, a catalyst to define what you want. That's all what it's serving. So that's, that's huge when we are trying to define and find clarity Okay, so I am in this big pile of stinky poo. Right. <laughs> I, 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 that, I that, that, that is the contemplation. Not where you are, mm -hmm. is where you want to be. And keep your eyes on it. And just remember that that experience, what you're going through right now, although it's offering a lot of discomfort, it's also we can use that energy to push us. You see, that's use that nervous energy to move you toward what you want. Because when you're comfortable, you're not really doing anything. But in, in the chaos, you can find actually a lot of opportunities. It's and outside of our comfort zone is where all the magic happens. Yes. The so it just magic. always remind ourselves that, you know, we're always in the right place, right place in the right time. Um, we have to, until we live, we always have to practice forgiveness. Right. We always have to remember that we're bigger than our problem. We are not the problem. We are the storytellers, and with that, we have the power to change the storyline. And <laughs> and we get a new pair of glasses every time when we shift. Well, right. <laughs> you, you just reminded me of a dream that I had years ago. And I always used to have these dreams that I was running, and I, I couldn't, my feet wouldn't move, you know. Mm -hmm. And I remember once having this dream that I was playing soccer. And I started running down the field, dribbling the ball, and my feet wouldn't move. And evidently, it was my first uh, uh, lucid dream that I remember. And I said, wait a minute, Mancuso, this is your dream. You can make it come out any way you want. And yeah. I got my feet to move and scored a goal, and that was it, you know. But life is that way, too. We can make things happen if we choose to but just like my patient who's who who was her pain mm -hmm. who her pain she needs that if 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 uh, another quote uh, uh, a name in about um, change and about uh, the flower and the bud um, you know and we find out that it's more painful to stick to remain as a bud to become a, than to become the flower you know mm -hmm. um, so many people live their lives as buds. Yes. And never yeah. get to be the flower. Um, mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's really sad for them. But you know what? Um, but, but that's again, so remember that's their journey. But it may when, not when their time comes, it's, they're going to they gonna go through the awakening. It's just some people need a more, little more suffering. They, right. they, they need a little bit two-by-fours before, before they get the urge to, to break out from that reality. That mm -hmm. reminds me of a Buddhist saying is that, you know, the analogy that we are all like little acorns, but mm -hmm. our potential is actually an oak tree. Exactly. So what is the catalyst that will waken up that potential in all of us? And that is, I think, recognizing that who we are, that we are divine spark of the universe, and we are creative forces. We're all unique, and we all have the full potential to become much more. And, and also, I think, to get out of ourselves, 
you know, uh, like when you said that you, you are naturally attracting people to you mm -hmm. and uh, because you are a wounded healer, a wounded healer have the experience to, to know what does it feel like. So your stories are becoming like an old hat mm -hmm. that, that you are not defined by it, but you honor the story and you honor the experience. And, I, and I, I, I agree with you with that, and I, I also know that at the root of all this is learning more than anything else to love yourself. Mm -hmm. Once yes, you learn to love yourself and accept yourself, that this body is just the vessel for this eternal soul of yours, um, and that you're on this journey um, toward growth and enlightenment, um, then you know once once you learn to love yourself, it makes the rest a whole lot easier. You know, it may not change your situation, but it just again changes your perception. Right? Yes, but when we are change our perception, it's interesting because it's a ripple effect. You yep. see, you change something within, and then it might not have uh, an, a quick automatic change from black and white, but it will create the beginning, you know, everything takes time, you know, like for example, if you put the acorn in the ground, in the fertile ground, you water it with your attention, with your love, and then it becomes the oak tree. Right, right. Um, I just see that my mind works this way and just made me think of something very silly. So somebody sent me a cartoon the other day, it was a butterfly driving a car, getting pulled over by a a police officer and mm -hmm. showing the driver's license and on the driver's license was a picture of a caterpillar. <laughs> the butterfly funny. said, this is an old picture of me. <laughs> yeah. I love it. But getting back, putting this together with Maxwell Maltz that we talked about at the beginning and how we perceive ourselves, so many butterflies perceive themselves as caterpillars. Yes. So it's time to let our wings out and awaken Absolutely. everyone around us. Absolutely. Come out from your cocoon. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we are reaching the end of our show, and I so appreciate your input, um, Phil. It was an amazing show, and brainstorming and masterminding about perception. So it's just always good to remember that we're never alone. We, every experience serves a purpose. The main shift that happens is really asking that, that not, not why me, but what can I learn from this and how can I use this and what is the gift in it? I, I think that to, to shorten that whole thing up is when that little voice comes up and says, why me, you just answer the question, why not? <laughs> I love it, why not? <laughs> um, I, I really appreciate you giving me the honor of being on your show. Uh, oh, it was a pleasure to have you. You're a delightful hostess. Um, I am I'm available. I'm sort of in between websites right now. I do have a, uh, a blog that needs upda updating desperately on uh, WordPress. It's uh, headspacecoach.wordpress.com, and it's called Just My Two Cents. I love those. I, I read your little two senses. I absolutely, they're so clever and there is so much truth in them. It's hilarious. Well, you know, you know, there's so much stuff that we carry around in our heads and I was always really proud of myself because I could remember my New Jersey driver's license number. M O two nine one six two six seven one O one four seven five until I read an article about Albert Einstein. And yes. then people had said that old Albert kept his um, phone number on a piece of paper in his wallet because mm -hmm. he didn't want to clutter his mind with useless information. Okay. Yes. So, but anyway, um, <laughs> see what happens. I didn't show my work on that one either. Um, That's okay. It's all good. But, well, this, but this has been fun. You're a delightful hostess. Um, and um, like I said, I've, I've got um, the... Uh, uh, blog on WordPress at headspacecoach at wordpress.com. I also have uh, a uh, presence on Facebook and uh, I hope and it's just called Headspace Coach 
you know. Yes, uh, I will post Facebook. it on my Facebook as well. And if you allow me, I would love to share your um, your writing or your blog about perception. Um, that's how I found you, and it was. I'm like, I need to meet this guy who wrote this article. Well, thank you. I, it's funny. I, I had not Googled that article in a long time, and. I found it had been reposted on a whole bunch of places, and one I was reading, I said, wait a minute, I wrote this, you know, and it was some blogger from Ghana. Uh-huh. You know, and I thought, well, that's nice, and uh, he had my old um, uh, email address in there. But the e email address that's on that may be incorrect. Um, uh, it should be mancusop at mac.com. Uh, Great. Yes. So I would love to share that with our viewers and also on my Facebook because it, it has profound truth that everything guys happens between your two ears and simply shifting your glasses, your perception will create a profound change in life. And just remember it's a ripple effect. Everything in our universe goes through a process and uh, that's combined with time. And uh, and that, but in a sense, it always leads us where we need to be. And also, always ask yourself that what can I do to improve not just my life, but everyone else around ourselves. Exactly. So we can collectively illuminate the collective consciousness. So. Thank you, thank you. It was a pleasure to have you and connect with you, and I had an awesome time. And look at our 20 minutes just flew by like <laughs> crazy. As, 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 as one frog said to the other, time is fun when you're having flies with friends. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Namaste. Thank, thank you. You have a great day. Bye now. You too. Bye-bye.